How do you improve on a 10 out of 10? That's the question that popped up in my head as I started to play Monster Hunter World Iceborne. Back when I reviewed Monster Hunter World last year, I gave it a 10, one of only three or so 10s I've ever given in years of reviewing video games. It's also my first 10 for a Monster Hunter game, a franchise that I've always scored high in the past but never quite gave that maximum rating to. Some would say that Monster Hunter 4U is arguably the best entry in the series, the perfect rendition of the game's traditional mechanics. Others would say that Generations Ultimate had more content than World, not to mention fun hunting styles that gave new life to its selection of weapons. Personally, I wouldn't argue with either of those observations. That's because I believe they're all fair and valid points. Monster Hunter World, however, was a different beast. Despite its faults, and it certainly had its share of them, World changed the game. Literally and figuratively. Although the Monster Hunter series has developed a rabid following in Japan and a small yet dedicated fan base in the West, it never reached the kind of mass market appeal outside its native shores that other Capcom properties such as Resident Evil achieved. But even as some reviews pan the games for being slow, unintuitive, and visually outdated, those who love the game held out hope that maybe, just maybe, something changes in the future and more folks give it enough of a chance. That change would finally arrive with Monster Hunter World. Thanks to big improvements in its visuals, as well as a slew of quality of life improvements, World's increased accessibility piqued more players' interest, and made them play the game long enough until that Monster Hunter Switch finally clicked. After all, Monster Hunter has never really been the easiest series to acclimate to. Once a person gets it, however, the game is known to sink its claws quite deeply into a gamer's psyche. Monster Hunter World introduced millions of players to the franchise knocking out Resident Evil 5 as Capcom's best-selling game ever in the process. It's a big reason why I gave Monster Hunter World a 10. It's also a big reason why Iceborne would need to do a heck of a lot more to get the same score. Like Mordor, one does not simply walk into the video game review scene and get 10s handed to them. This is especially true for a follow-up like Iceborne, given how revolutionary the changes World introduced were, changes that are now old hat. Iceborne can't be just as good as the game that preceded it, it had to be much better than World. So rewinding back to about less than a week after we got our review codes, I got a bit of a surprise after receiving a text from my coworker, who got a review code as well. The guy actually took vacation to play Iceborne and had just finished its main campaign. In his text was the phrase, quote unquote, 10 slash 10, or 10 out of 10. This coworker, by the way, has been playing Monster Hunter even longer than me. I started with Monster Hunter Freedom Unite, which is an expanded version of the second game. He started with the very first game on PS2. So when I received his text, I was about halfway through the campaign. Now, I personally love Monster Hunter. I've actually been doing key quests for the Japanese versions of the game since Monster Hunter 3U. Some of you have probably seen some of those key quest guides. That being said, Based on my experience with the Iceborne expansion so far, I thought it was good, but not 10 good. At the time, I was leaning more towards an 8.5. I got another text after saying that, and it said, just finish it. <laughs> so in the coming days after that, I would go through the full campaign twice. The first time I did it by myself, as a solo player. The second time, I would go through all the key quests again while helping another hunting partner finish the game while testing out the new two-player scaling. As one of the first people to actually finish the game, I would also help out other media folks with their Volcana hunts after Capcom staff got inundated by multiplayer requests during the review period. Every single session that I played yielded memorable moments that are now part of my personal pantheon of Monster Hunter memories. There was a time I saved a dizzy hunting partner from a potential cart with a well-timed river blast counter that sent said hunter flying just as the monster was about to connect. One time I was the one who was dizzy and in low health, and my hunting partner, who was actually having trouble learning the timing for clutch claw mounts up to that point, well, that hunting partner actually saved me by clutching the monster's head as it was about to hit me, redirecting it with a slap, and then sending the poor creature crashing straight into a wall. That partner, by the way, was my niece, who used to struggle a lot when we were playing Monster Hunter Generations. That was actually the first Monster Hunter game that she really played a lot. This time around, she ended up finishing the Iceborne campaign with me while wearing only Beatotus armor. As someone who brought many younger relatives into Monster Hunter, it's one of my prouder moments. This is especially true when I look back to World and remember how some folks 
used to kick my knees out when we would join Kulv Tarath raids because her level was too low for them. Also note how both of the memorable moments that I talk about actually involved new mechanics from the game, thanks to the addition of new moves such as the last counter and the new player mechanics, you now have even more opportunities and more plays that were possible. And I was admittedly skeptical of the slinger mechanics at first, which I thought were being needlessly shoehorned into the game. After my first 100 plus hours with Iceborne, however, I can't even imagine playing without them. Admittedly, the implementation of the Slinger mechanics can be hit or miss depending on the weapon. The Greatsword Slinger mechanics, for example, are quite game-changing, largely due to the ability to not only get to your true charge slash right away, but also its ability to make you reposition the direction of your charge after you fire the ammo. For other weapons like Bogan, however, it feels a bit tacked on. Fortunately, one new slinger mechanic is universally fun, and that would be the Clutch Claw. This is easily my favorite addition to Iceborne for a couple of reasons. One is its ability to help you create weak points on a monster, regardless of which weapon you use. And yes, that even includes light weapons. It takes a bit longer, but you can still soften monster parts, even when using a light weapon like an Insect Glade, for example. The other is how it allows you to slam monsters into walls and send them toppling down. It's easily one of the most satisfying aspects of Iceborne especially since it gives you one more avenue to perform clutch plays. Puns are totally intended. <laughs> I especially had fun concocting all sorts of strategies to increase my clutch claw wall slamming opportunities, whether it be wearing earplugs to shake off roars the first time I meet a monster, or even certain mantles to avoid dropping when a monster attacks with that specific body part that I'm clinging to. Admittedly, I was a bit worried that it could be rife for abuse. Fortunately, the game puts limits on clutching opportunities, particularly for wall slam, so you can't just spam it infinitely. Some monsters such as Anjanath also develop a tolerance for it, standing up quickly if you use it too much. All in all, I'm now a big fan of its implementation into the game. Another big addition to Iceborne is a new island called the Guiding Lands. This unlocks after you finish the campaign for the first time and acts like a souped up expedition mode that allows you to hunt a variety of monsters in one island. The Guiding Lands is divided to different zones that emulate the previous maps and world. Each zone can also be leveled up, allowing you to hunt a certain set of monsters, the higher its level. These include special monsters that can only be first unlocked via this new island. The main catch is that leveling up one zone can cause the other zones to level down. The Guiding Lands is definitely designed to give people more things to do during endgame, which was a common complaint heard about world once people did all the content and special events. Add the fact that certain ores and materials, as well as monster drops needed for endgame gear and upgrades, only show up in Guiding Lands, and it's a feature that the game's most dedicated players will definitely have to frequently visit if they want to have the best stuff in the game. Iceborne also doubles down on the quality of life improvements introduced by World by adding its fair share of features to make hunters' lives easier. One is the ability to use mounts called Raider Rides, which make traveling through areas and getting to monsters a lot easier. Raider rides are especially helpful in big maps like Horror Frost Reach, allowing you to catch up more quickly to monsters that change zones, while also letting you consume items or sharpen your weapons along the way. Layered armor, meanwhile, can now be crafted in one place by the smithy, though it still requires materials from special quests. For solo and duo players, each Palico gadget earns new skills when leveled up. If you're worried about failing a tough hunt due to carding, for example, you can have your cat equip the leveled up Virgawas Resurrection, to get one free revive per hunt when your HP gets reduced to zero. If you want your cat to attract the monster's attention so you're able to attack more freely, you can level up the Shield Spar gadget to unlock the Shield Spar Stooge. The Plunder Blade, meanwhile, can be leveled up to unlock a new mounting plunder attack for your cat. Folks who like to beautify their personal quarters also have more options now to decorate their rooms. These include new flooring, furniture, and wall decorations, some of which you'll need to find by doing certain things. <laughs> you also have a new slate of pets to catch and take home, including penguins and hot spring macaques. Augments, meanwhile, get some tweaks, particularly for Master Rank. While you still have familiar augments such as affinity increase and health regeneration, each skill now requires a certain amount of free slots. Some might require just one slot, others might require two or three. The number of available slots on a weapon can vary from weapon to weapon as well, with some not even having any slots. Previous augments also disappear when upgrading a weapon to Master Rank. The good news is that all the stream stones you use for those augments are returned to you. Just keep in mind that Master Rank weapons are now augmented by different means, 
so it no longer uses the old method and materials. For folks worried about not being able to fit all their desired augments within a limited number of slots, there's a second method that lets you augment while ignoring a weapon slot capacity. The only caveat is that the augments you get are incremental and it requires a lot of materials, including guiding lance drops and items. This basically means that you will have to do a lot of grinding in order to get enough of a boost from this particular type of augmenting. Once again, this is definitely endgame activity for players who are aiming for meta gear. Of course, the best part of any Monster Hunter game is, well, it's monsters. Iceborne does not disappoint in this regard. Capcom was not kidding when it said that the expansion is pretty much a new game, as the number of new additions to the monster roster is pretty close to World's Base game. Granted, Base World did not have as many monsters as some of the previous games, but it's a totally new game, so things had to be done from scratch. Also, while there are a lot of returning monsters, Iceborne boasts more new monsters than we've typically seen in past g rank games, which is what Master Rank used to be called, whether it be more minor monsters such as Beatotus and Bambro, to elder dragons such as Vulcana and Namiel, Iceborne boasts a nice amount of new monsters who are appearing in the series for the first time. There's also a lot of returning monsters from past games, as well as subspecies and variants of monsters that appeared in World. Iceborne does an especially good job with water monsters such as Coral Puki Puki and Namiel, were some of the more fun creatures to hunt in the game. Returning favorites, such as Baradoth meanwhile, not only look better than ever, but are also the most fun they've ever been to hunt. At least for me. They just look so much more imposing and impressive, and they feel faster to boot. This is especially true for Yang Garuga, who was already a fleet-footed bugger, but seems even faster this time around. That being said, Yan Garuga used to be one of my least favorite monsters to hunt because it was such a pain to deal with. <laughs> but I love its Iceborne rendition for some reason. The fight just feels so intense, and in a good way. So I ended up hunting the monster several times, because I find it to be a lot of fun. <laughs> then there's my favorite flagship monster, the Thunderlord himself, Zenogre. I was fortunate enough to see Zenogre in-game while playing Iceborne before he was officially announced, and I just about lost my mind when Fulgur bugs started showing up. That's because I knew full well who was coming out after that. The same thing goes for Yan Garuga and its full cutscene involving Devil Joe, which just put the stupid smile on my face. For longtime fans such as myself, seeing these returning monsters given the full world visual treatment is simply a treat and ups the game's entertainment value that much more. As for newer players who first started playing Monster Hunter with World, well, you're in for a treat fighting these classic creatures. And by treat, I mean best of luck in your future endeavors. <laughs> Hey, at least you've got mandals and all these quality of life improvements now, such as not having to flex your biceps every time you chug a mega potion. I mean, Rajang just got teased as I'm recording this, and if he's anywhere close to what he used to be, <laughs> a lot of works are going to be in for a rude awakening. Now, as much as I enjoyed Iceborne, however, it certainly isn't perfect. While I like the concept of the guiding lands, it can get very grindy, especially when you find yourself constantly leveling and re-leveling various zones to gain access to different monsters. Iceborne is definitely designed with greater attention to endgame in mind, but I can see some of these endgame activities being huge time sinks that can quickly add up over time. It also remains to be seen whether the addition of guiding lands ends up splitting the online player base. It might not be a problem after launch when you have a large number of players, but it could lead to a more diluted pool for investigations and event quests. One thing that I found a bit annoying about Iceborne was the Linian picture quests which requires you to take pictures of Cat Tribe doing various actions for the Linian researcher. There were times, for example, when I would turn in photos of the cats, just like the description says, whether it be crossing swords or expressing surprise. And for some reason, they don't end up satisfying the requirement. It's just frustrating given the time it takes to do these things, only for you to come back and find out your effort was for naught. My advice is to take as many pictures of the same scene as you can, as you never know when a picture you think is perfect ends up not satisfying the requirements. There are also returning issues from World that has not been addressed in Iceborne. This include the cumbersome system for doing story quests in multiplayer mode. For those involving expeditions, for example, you basically have to trigger the cutscene, then back out and redo the mission in order to play it with other people, particularly if all of you haven't done the mission before. For folks who have already finished their missions and are now helping others to do their missions, you still have to wait for the hosting player to watch the cutscenes before you can join. I just wish there was a more elegant solution to this as the current system feels a bit counterintuitive. One potential sticking point for other players is the lack of a transmog system for layering armor. Unless my coworker and I are missing something, 
both of us have not seen any way to transmog armor, and I'm master rank 70 plus and he's master rank 100 plus. Now, it's something that could very well be added in a future update, but as of now, we haven't seen it in the base game. Even with those faults, Iceborne remains a great game overall. It basically builds on all the fun things about World, resulting in a more polished and fleshed out package. Honestly, even now, I'm still kind of wavering between giving it a 9.5 or a 10. I mean, if I just base it off how I felt the first time I unlocked Guiding Lands, I'd give it a 10. Because everything up to that point was really good. But then once I add all the things I've had to do, as far as Guiding Lands and all the grinding that it required, I'm not kind of going down to 9.5, especially if you add the fact that you don't have Transmog. At least we haven't figured a way to do it. And then once again, Rajang gets teased, and now I want to give it a 10 once more. <laughs> Looking at it objectively, I'd say that Iceborne isn't quite as revolutionary as World was. At the same time, I also think that it's a better monster in the world, with even more monsters to hunt, and new fun mechanics that make the core experience even better. Ultimately, being described as a better monster in the world is not a bad place to be. If you love the series, and especially love the jump to world, Iceborne is going to blow your socks off.